All right, so I'm going to this uh, we have now narrowed it down to sort of one experiment, behavioral economics, and this is called the ultimatum game. And uh, this this game was uh, developed in 1982 by a, a guy named Werner Guth, and uh, this is the game that really uh, broke the back, I think, of, of rational economic man. And uh, okay, the thing is, this someone gives you say a hundred dollars, you know, look at the person next to you, gives you a hundred dollars, you have to share it with the person next to you. So Sandra, you have to share it with her. So you can give her, as, you know, she knows that I've given you this hundred dollars, I've asked you to share it with her. You can give her as much or as little as you want. You have to give her at least a dollar, say. So if you're rash, but she could, the key is she can reject the offer if she doesn't like it, if she doesn't think it's fair. So if you're a rational economic man, you'll give her a dollar. She should be happy because she's, you know, more is preferred to less. She doesn't worry about uh, anything that you have $99 or anything else. But if you do that, most likely she'll reject the offer. Uh, anything under around 30% is typically rejected. The typical offer is 40 or 50%. And this has been played in uh, literally hundreds of societies around the world. Uh, every society has some notion of fairness, but it varies from society to society. Let me just give you um, a couple of examples. Well, I'll give you one example. There was a society uh, in, in New Guinea <coughs> called the Owl, <coughs> and uh, the offers there, people gave really super fair offers, 80 or 90 percent, and the offers were usually rejected, and they, you know, they couldn't figure out, like, what's going on here? But in that society, that's called a big man culture. So I, I have $100, I give Sander $90 just to show that I'm, I'm better than him, I'm a bigger man than him. Of course he's going to reject it to put me in his place. <laughs> but it, if, you, if you didn't know the culture of that society, you, you couldn't interpret this result. So all societies have sense of fairness and uh, you know, retaliation responsibility, but it, it differs. It's about, here it's around, people uh, usually offer around 40%, and anything under 30% is usually rejected. Yeah. Uh, and I, we've actually played this in Nigeria, a little Anibo village in Nigeria. And uh, we played it for real money, uh, not much money. It was about $2, but this is like two days' income in that, that country. And everybody gave 50%, almost everyone. So, and, uh, and it was you know, anonymous. They knew somebody else in the village of about 1,000 people was going to get the money, but they didn't know who. So I mean, very, Okay, so anyway, um, what does this have to do with the climate change policy? Again, I think the thing I've learned is that these regularities like loss aversion, fairness, and so on, uh, that are considered irrational by economists and dismissed as anomalies, these are the things that really make us human. This makes us different than almost any other animals. It's irrational behavior that makes us human. Okay, I'm going to get do two uh, quick experiments. Okay, this is an example of ducks on a pond uh, at Cambridge University. This pond had 33 ducks. And they did this experiment where they would throw out balls of dough. And one person threw out like a dough ball every 15 seconds, the other every 30 seconds. So the payoff was like twice as much for the, the 15 second. And almost immediately the ducks organized themselves in what's called a Nash equilibrium. There were 22 ducks in front of the first guy, 11 ducks in front of the second guy. And it, you know, the ducks were moving back and forth, but they were acting you know, exactly like this rational actor model. And uh, there's been some controversy with the experiment. It's been duplicated uh, in some instances though. But you know, it's, it's amazing. On the other hand, <clears throat> humans don't act like that. And this is an experiment uh, comparing humans and pigeons. And uh, you know, the idea was that uh, you had the, either the pigeon or a student would like either hit or peck a keyboard. And uh, there was some reward. You know, you didn't know which there were rewards behind some of the keys and not others. And uh, but the thing was, the more you if the more you pecked or poked the key and nothing happened, that meant there was nothing under there. Okay, the pigeons would quickly switch to another key if nothing happened, but, you know, the students would keep hitting the key, you know, thinking that, okay, it's got to pay off, the odds are increasing that there's something behind there, something that's called the sunk cost effect. So the pigeons, um, you know, routinely almost always outperform the students on this, uh, this experiment. And there are lots of things like this. Again, it's these, uh, you know, I... I got to find another term besides lower animals, <laughs> but it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's cognitively challenged or something. But non-human animals are more likely to act according to this, you know, strictly rational model than humans. Humans are very unique in terms of culture uh, and so on. 
Okay, so what have I learned? Um, understanding the evolution of behavior is really critical, and there are some amazing uh, experiments in neuroscience uh, research on the evolution of things like discounting. How do, how do animals discount? How do our closest relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, discount? Uh, human behavior is extremely uh, plastic. You know, very. It can, we can, uh, uh, as somebody mentioned before, we really keep uh, developing uh, like an embryo after birth, uh, uh, and we can be sort of hardwired and, and programmed depending on social context and so on. Incentives are socially constructed. Um, the degree of cooperation among humans is really unique among uh, different animals. Almost any kind of behavior is possible uh, in human societies. In a way, putting these up are kind of embarrassing. Anyone but an economist would look at these and say, you know, yeah. But it's, um, again, it, this is ch changing how, uh, how economists look at the world. Okay, so I just put up uh, a few things, sort of, uh, you know, what kind of research is needed. I think, uh, as we talked about in our group, incentives are more than, than just income. If you sort of throw away this Walrasian mathematical framework, a lot of economics can be salvaged, that is, the focus on the individual, the role of incentives uh, in behavior. Well-being is more than income. This is something uh, the top economists have learned. The third thing is a little bit more tricky. The macro economy is, uh, is not a firm. And even ecological economists, environmental, a good environmental economists still tend to treat the macro economy as being a firm in terms of efficiency and so on. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Three minutes. Well, let me, let me talk about that, because uh, I'll give an example. Um, there's a province in China called Maozhen Province, and uh, in that province, uh, the bees have become extinct because, and so, uh, you know, pesticides or whatever, so there are no bees. So apple orchards, apple trees, uh, peach trees have to be pollinated by hand. There's a great picture of a, of a woman uh, pollinating an apple blossom with a pair of chopsticks. Some of you may have seen it. Okay, if you look at it in, in any sort of, like a firm, okay, that's, that's, this is really bad. This is a net loss. You were getting a service for free. Now you're having to pay for it. But in terms of the macro economy, this is probably a positive thing. In other words, that increases economic output to the multiplier effect and so on. And this is really horrible. Uh, you know, the economy can prosper by taking away services that used to be free from nature and monetizing them. And you, you can increase total economic output and income and so on. I mean, this is a, a basic thing that uh, uh, nobody, well, somebody must be looking at it, but it's not done. Okay, the fourth thing is the importance of institutions. And uh, a lot of us were happy in, in economics when Eleanor Ostrom won uh, the Nobel Prize because her focus was on uh, institutions. We always focus not only economists, but everybody else. It's either the government or it's the free market. But for you know, most activities, there's something else, especially in uh, some of the, the third world countries like that slide I just showed. So it, the, understanding the role of institutions, how institutions mediate uh, markets, government actions, and so on is, is absolutely critical. And let me just end with a quote from a, a person that really taught me how to think about economics, Nicholas Sergescu-Rosian. 